Okay, so we're going to continue talking about disinfection today. Uh, you'll remember that last time we mainly focused on chlorine disinfection and talked about the need for disinfection and kind of what the stakes are if we get it wrong when it comes to human disease. Um, homework four, which mainly covers through membrane filtration, is due before class on Monday and then at the beginning of Monday's class we're going to have a brief quiz. Um, so in addition to continuing our discussion on disinfection today, we're also going to talk a little bit about the configuration of disinfection contact facilities, uh, kind of the reactor design, and then also briefly cover corrosion control and how that affects lead and copper concentrations, and then the need for fluoridation. Any questions on the announcements? Um, you probably remember from environmental engineering different types of reactors. Continuously stirred tank reactors, which are sometimes also called completely mixed flow reactors, is at one extreme where you have water coming into a basin and hopefully immediately dispersed and continually mixed for the entire time that it's in there. At the other end of the spectrum is a plug flow reactor where what we hope is that there's no mixing of the particles as it travels through the reactor. And typically plug flow reactors are long and skinny to try and achieve that, uh, to limit the amount of dispersal, to limit the amount of diffusion, and keep all of the water that enters the reactor. If we think about you know, one liter entering the reactor, ideally what we would see at the exit of a reactor is that same one liter exiting in the same period of time that it entered the reactor to begin with. And so there are a number of different things that designers can do to help guide the flow into becoming more plug-like. Um, obviously because you're going to have the no-slip condition at the edge of the basin, there is going to be some drag. And the fluid particles that are at the edge of the reactor are going to be moving more slowly than the fluid particles at the center of the reactor. So even when you do have some of these um, baffling configurations, it's not baffling like confusing, it's baffling in the sense that you've put in baffles to try and uh, reduce turbulence as it's changing directions and to try and smooth and guide the flow around the corners. And so you can see that that may be circular shaped turning veins or even flat turning veins help to ensure that there's less mixing in the edges um, because it's going to force some of the flow to go, go around the entirety of that corner rather than there being a lot of short circuiting. And short circuiting will be something we see on a lot of the different figures we look at today because short circuiting means that some of the reactor isn't being actually actively used for flow that it's just stagnant water and that the velocity is zero. And so if you think about, if we just had a square edge without any veins, the water that's flowing and is about to change directions is unlikely to actually flow around this corner and then up the edge and then around this corner. Um, water flows through the path of least resistance and the path of least resistance is going to be just around this corner relatively quickly, not taking the longer path around this outside area. And so this dead zone reduces the effective volume of the reactor and uh, also introduces turbulence. So each of these different measures are used to limit volume that is dead and enhance the plug-like flow through the reactor. Um, at the extreme, adding baffles at each of the straight uh, raceways is a way to help ensure good dispersal of the flow. And so these baffles you could think of as maybe a series of interconnected straws. They're straws glued together and a whole tower or stack of them. Uh, we have baffles in the flow visualization lab we do with the, uh, the long skinny tube where the marbles is flowing, uh, excuse me, the, the water is flowing up and around the marbles so that you can have water entering a chamber with a single pipe or a jet 
And as the water is forced to flow around a series of interconnected obstacles, it kind of disperses the water so it's evenly diffused instead of just having a single jet going through and causing a lot of turbulence. Um, the water is forced to have the streamlines kind of evenly dispersed. So those are some of the considerations that designers keep in mind when they are selecting and configuring chlorine contact chambers. Because remember, what we're going for with dose is concentration times time. And if you have a wide variety of contact times where one fluid particle can make it through the reactor in five minutes, but another fluid particle spends 15 minutes in the reactor, it's hard to know exactly what the dose is being delivered if you have a wide variety of contact times for any particular particle. It's better to have every particle exposed to the same time and reduce the uncertainty so that then you can select the minimum concentration of chlorine that will give you the needed dose. So here is some illustrations of pore baffling in contact basins. And you can see from the side view that we're not just worried about how the water flows from this top view kind of aspect, but the water could do short circuiting where you have the inlet pipe and the water's just going to go in the shortest path to the outlet pipe if that's all you've got. And so there's this jet of water that's headed towards the outlet and then these uh, shaded regions are referred to as dead zones because although there's water there, it's not like it's just a void. Um, this volume, the overall volume of the reactor, doesn't actually predict what the transit time is from the inlet pipe to the outlet pipe. Because we need to know C times T, concentration times time. And the easiest way to calculate time, T, is the volume of the reactor divided by the flow rate. That's the hydraulic residence time. But the actual residence time isn't going to be the hydraulic residence time if the water is just transiting straight from the path to the inlet to the outlet because of all this dead zone. So we see some, both for a rectangular contact basin and a circular contact basin, some of the configurations that would lead to poor performance. If you have the inlet in a circular contact basin and the outlet both at the top, then there's no reason for the water to be going down to the bottom of the reactor. So although that is liquid storage volume, it's not contributing to the contact time. So this is a little bit better. This was poor performance on this slide. A little bit better is when we separate um, the flow to force it to go both up and down through a series of perforated baffles. And if we're going to be e entering the rectangular tank about in the middle, and it's going to be exiting at the top through a weir, at least we prevent this direct from the inlet pipe to the outlet pipe by putting in these obstacles along the way, where the water has to flow down under this wall section, up through another. So you're getting a little bit more contact time relative to the overall volume, but there are still dead zones. So the, the final slide that I'll show you in this series illustrates what we could do to try and achieve um, enhanced performance and improved contact time that's closer, more closely matching the hydraulic residence time. In the case of the circular contact basin, you can see that the performance is improved here because the water is forced downward rather than in the previous example already entering the contact basin at the top. So at least when you have the water coming in to the circular basin from the top to the bottom, we're forcing it down to the bottom before it flows up towards the weir at the launder around the edge of the circular contact basin. Now here in the superior baffling, we have uh, just a real maze for the water to have to flow through, both in the plan view, looking from the top, and then also the side view. So if you look at the water from the top, um, we have a series of baffles that forces the water to go laterally before coming back down and all of these openings are lined up so that they're looking at on either side solid wall. So you'd never have two openings in a row. You'd have opening wall and then opening, well I guess here we've got two openings in a row. Maybe it'd be better if this wall was a bit wider 
but it's mainly just a schematic to illustrate that if you have a series of barriers and um, both vertically and laterally the water is forced to flow through the majority of this reactor, then we have a lot less dead space. In this final contact chamber, there's maybe some dead space as the water is approaching the overflow weir at the top. So those are the principles that we aim for when it comes to contact basins. And um, what we've just been talking about, the hydraulic detention time is the volume divided by the flow rate. But in trying to characterize the performance of contact basins, it's typical that treatment facilities have to estimate something called T sub 10. And that's how much time 90% of the water is in the contact uh, basin. And so just the reason why it's called 10 instead of T90 is 10% of the water is going to be in the contact chamber less than T10. And so that's a problem for us. If there's water that's making it through really quickly, then that's the water that potentially didn't get disinfected enough. So it's because of that fraction of the water that gets through the contact chamber too quickly is a little is the main reason why we would add an excess of um, of chlorine or whatever the disinfectant is compared to what we could get away with if the water was behaving in perfect plug flow performance. So um, there have been some empirical studies that looked at the length to width ratio of chlorine contact basins and then the hydraulic performance of that and as you'd expect as you have a really long length compared to how wide it is the better the performance of the T10 to T0 and what we want perfect plug flow behavior would be a T10 to T0 of 1 if it was 1 then that means that the uh, the water that is uh, at the 10% threshold is spending as long in the contact basin as the hydraulic detention time. And so the longer the contact basin, the more likely it is that um, you're actually going to experience the plug flow behavior. And this is irrespective of any kind of baffling. So with improved baffling, you don't necessarily <coughs> have to have a contact basin that is you know, if we say superior is a T10 to T0 of 0.7, to get 0.7, that would ordinarily mean that you have to have a basin that's about 37 times longer than it is wide. Well, none of these are 37 times longer than they are wide. That's really not practical in a chlorine contact basin, but it's not necessary if you do put in baffles and other... Um, measures to try and enhance um, diffusion inside of the contact basin. Ozone is a special case because chlorine we can add once at the head end of the contact chamber and then we don't have to add any more because chlorine is persistent. Um, it will stay in solution. I mean eventually it will um, go out into the air but it would take a couple of hours for water to diffuse out of, uh, for chlorine to diffuse out of water. Whereas ozone um, is a much shorter lived compound. And so it has to be injected to the contact basins at multiple locations. And so here in this diagram, you can see that the ozone gas is being added in several different spots. Now, you've probably smelled ozone before. It has kind of an acrid or bitter smell. If you've ever operated the blender for a few minutes and you start to get that electricity smell, what you're smelling is ozone. Um, ozone is an environmental pollutant when it's at ground level. Uh, sometimes places that have poor air quality like Los Angeles or other urban environments where they're surrounded on all sides by mountains, uh, vehicle exhaust can be high in ozone and that's bad at ground level. Of course, ozone in the upper atmosphere is good because it filters out ultraviolet irradiation, but it's the same O3 chemical, ozone, that we can use for drinking water disinfection. And um, it has the advantage of being a really potent oxidizer, like it's really powerful, 
Um, but because it's so powerful, it, it doesn't last in the water for very long. And it breaks down into just oxygen. And so it has to be added several different places to get the, uh, the cumulative concentration times time that you need to achieve um, appropriate disinfection. So if you're using ozone just for oxidation to improve the, the taste of water, you'd maybe only need two to four of these contact cells. And uh, giardia and viruses are a little bit more um, hardy than just oxidizing the water for aesthetic purposes, and so you'd need more cells. And then in the case of cryptosporidium, it's the most rugged of all the pathogens we might expect to see in drinking water treatment. And so you could need 10 or more contact cells for ozone. Um, what I think is interesting is how tall these, uh, these contact cells are. Our text says that the typical height of these contact cells is between six to seven and a half meters. And so think about six meters, you're talking like 20 feet tall. And the reason for that is just efficiency. Because if you're diffusing the bubbles at the bottom, uh, they're going to be moving up. They don't dissolve into solution like chlorine does. They stay as uh, little gas bubbles. Well, it does dif uh, dissolve into the solution, but it's dissolving from a gas to a liquid rather than starting with a liquid like you would with chlorine. And so if you had it be shallow, if it was only one meter, then you'd be adding all this ozone and it would just bubble out. And it, there wouldn't be an efficient exchange of the gas into solution. So the reason why we have such a tall contact basin for ozone is just to ensure that we get as much of the ozone actually dissolved into the water as possible. And uh, with these heights of six to seven and a half meters, you can achieve about 85% efficiency from the amount of ozone that's generated to what makes it into solution. Okay, ultraviolet disinfection is pretty interesting because it doesn't actually kill the microorganisms that are being irradiated. It just inactivates them. And so the, uh, the viruses are still there in the water and the bacteria maybe are still alive after they've been irradiated. But the bacteria, the viruses, other pathogens, they can't reproduce after they've been exposed by UV, and so they can't get you sick. Uh, they've had their DNA scrambled, so they can't reproduce. Now, the reason why people are interested in UV is that it can be an economical technology that provides protection against some organisms that chemical disinfection is not very effective against. And so it's kind of like a belt and suspenders approach. You know, you, you use the chemical disinfection for your residual, you use UV disinfection for these resilient pathogens like Giardia and Crypto, and that two-phase approach is, is really excellent, especially because if you're using UV, then it means you don't have to add as much chlorine. So it reduces the amount of disinfection byproducts that may form because you're not having to chlorinate the water as heavily as you would as if compared to not using UV. There's some um, downsides, obviously. These use electricity, and so the energy costs can be high. And in part, just because it's a newer technology and it's hard to calculate the exact dose that every particle receives, there's been historically a little bit of reluctance on state and local agencies to adopt UV, although the federal government's in favor of UV disinfection. And uh, there are a couple of EPA rules that push utilities towards UV. And uh, another issue is just the, uh, the implementation of UV in waters, especially that have high hardness. There can be fouling on the lamp sleeves. And I'll show you a couple of cutaways here. Um, there are both open reactors like this, where the water flows through a channel, not under pressure. Or it can be an enclosed reactor where the water is under pressure as it flows around the bulbs. Um, the bulbs are actually encased in quartz sleeves. And it's quartz rather than glass because glass would absorb the UV rays, whereas quartz uh, passes the UV through the outside. But you'll notice that inside of the reactor, there's this sleeve wiper that goes back and forth. Sometimes it will be like a brush. 
Other times it's similar to a squeegee and there may be acid solutions that are injected to try and help clean off that quartz sleeve because if the water has high hardness or if there's particles in the water that may settle onto the sleeve, then it will coat the quartz lamp sleeve, absorb the UV, and then less of the energy is actually making it into the water. Uh, so that's one of the issues. And then in the same way that short circuiting and dead zones are a problem in chlorine contact chambers, the same issue can be a problem in UV irradiation. If you have the water coming into a reactor, not every particle that enters the reactor is going to spend exactly the same period of time. You know, one little element of water may go pretty quickly towards the outlet. Another one may take an indirect circuitous route that exposes it to more UV because of the longer time. So it can be a challenge characterizing the uh, mixing performance inside the reactor. And there's been a lot of companies that have focused on resolving that issue. So I kind of hinted before that UV irradiation scrambles the D, uh, DNA of target organisms in the same way that you get skin cancer from too much UV. Um, microorganisms get adjacent thymine uh, dimers uh, joined together. And so there are uh, four nucleic acids in DNA. And when there are two thiamines in a row, it's sensitive to uh, being fused through UV light. And so it may only be you know, one every thousand base pairs that are two thiamines in a row. But when there are, it just because of the absorptivity of the thiamine and the relative wavelength of UV, which the microbial wavelength of UV is around the 250 nanometers range. It, it fuses together the DNA and then the microorganism is maybe still alive but not able to rep replicate so people don't get sick. So here's a look at um, different doses that are used for inactivation of cryptosporidium, giardia, and viruses. And interestingly, uh, this virus in question is adenovirus, which uh, a lot of kids get sick with when they're young. But this is kind of the reverse of what we saw with chlorine disinfection, where chlorine really easily uh, managed viruses. It was a lot less effective against crypto and giardia. But here, UV is very effective against them. And so it, it kind of speaks to the uh, complementary and uh, synergistic nature of combining UV and chlorine together, because UV is good at what chlorine isn't. Now, log credit. Um, the government mandates that if you have a certain dose, then you'll be given a certain credit of removal for these potential uh, contaminants. And the reason why they do it that way, rather than having the utility actually make physical measurements of how much crypto and giardia was there and how much was inactivated, is that um, these contaminants are transitory. They're not always in the water. I mean, there's pretty much always going to be bacteria and viruses in water, but crypto and giardia come and go. And so they're not always going to be there, and so it wouldn't be practical to expect every utility to be making daily measurements and checking to see how their UV is performing. So instead of doing an actual lab-based approach for um, UV, they have done kind of widespread testing of what uh, UV dose would be required to remove a certain fraction of all of these different constituents. And so you can see, for example, you get three nines of removal, meaning 99.9% .9 removal if you expose cryptosporidium to a dose of 12 millijoules per centimeter squared. And just as a reminder, joule is a watt of energy exposed for a second. So what we're talking about is UV, which is similar to light. We have to know not only the intensity of the irradiation, but also the duration of exposure. So again, that's analogous to chlorine, where we had C times T approach, concentration times time. So in UV speak, the uh, intensity of the irradiation is sometimes called the fluence. 
And uh, we also have to keep track of the time. So just to provide an abundance of, uh, of protection, a typical design dose for UV reactors is 40 millijoules per square centimeter. And you can see that would provide a lot of uh, protection against crypto and giardia. And the reason why they've got such a safety factor there is because of the uncertainty having to do with short circuiting inside of the reactor. All right, so let's get some calculation practice with UV. So I've got a cylindrical UV reactor here. And what we're assuming is that there's just a single lamp on the inside. And what that lamp is doing is it's radiating energy outward in all directions. And so here's the lamp, and the energy is going out in all directions. So however much power is going into that lamp is going to be exerted over a certain circumference. And then we have to think about the length of the reactor. And so there's an outside surface area that all of that energy is being exerted over. And uh, so just to set the stage here, we've got 250 liters per second entering this reactor. We know the length of the reactor, the inside diameter of the reactor. And of course, if we know those dimensions, we're going to be able to calculate the volume here in part A. Uh, the exposure time is described by the, uh, um, the volume of the reactor and the flow rate. So you can calculate the, the time that the water spends in the reactor what we're asking here is just the hydraulic residence time in part B. In part C, we're calculating that cylinder surface area, which I mentioned is, is the area at which the energy is, uh, is being absorbed. If it doesn't come in contact with a particle, then it's going out to the outside edge of that cylinder shape. And then here in part D, um, we want to know the required UV intensity. So it says that we're looking for a dose of at least 40 millijoules per square centimeter. The dose close to the lamp is going to be higher than that. The further away you get from the lamp, the dose is decreasing. So we're going to go with the worst case scenario, and we're going to assume that some particle comes into the reactor and flows along the outside edge and then ex exits the reactor. So that's what this minimum, uh, this at least of 40 millijoules per square centimeter. Uh, and then the other aspect of this is that the lamp is 30% efficient. And so we're going to calculate in all these steps A through E how much ultraviolet irradiation we want there to be entering the reactor. And then part F, that's how much electricity do we have to put into the lamp in order to get a certain amount of ultraviolet energy. So these questions are asked in an order that you're going to need to know to, in, in the end, calculate the lamp power. And here are some of the formulas off to the side. And the reminder about the units, that a joule is a watt times a second. Okay, So this is one I think it would be beneficial if you collaborate and uh, check with people. I'll be circulating around because I've got the solution to this one. And, then after seven or eight minutes, we'll revisit and uh, take a look at it together. All right, so let me just talk you through the steps here. Um, so first things first, we want to know the volume of the reactor. So like I was just saying, it's the end area multiplied by the length. Okay, So the end area is 0 0.09621 meters squared. And then multiply that by the 1.25 meter length of the reactor. And so it should have a volume of 0 0.1203 cubic meters. And now, if we know the volume and the flow rate that's going through there is 250 liters per second, then we can figure out it takes about half a second 
is how long the water is spending inside of the reactor. 0.4812 seconds is the average exposure time. Now, of course, there's a whole range, but that's the uh, hydraulic residence time. Any questions so far on the area, volume, or time? Okay, so um, here on C it says calculate the cylinder surface area, excluding the ends. And so that's just like if, if this, you think of this as a can, if you were to cut the can, you know, cut off the ends and then lay it flat, what's the surface area there? And we can calculate the surface area by the circumference multiplied by the length. And so circumference is pi d. And the length of it, of course, 1.25 meters. So the outside surface area, 1.374 meters squared. Now, the required UV intensity. The reason why we've calculated the cylinder area is we're going to have to find out how much power per area there is. Um, oh, by the way, if it's 1.3 74 meters squared, then I also needed to convert that to centimeters squared. And in one meter squared, it's 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters. So 1.374 meters squared is 13,744 centimeters squared. Okay, so intensity. We need 40 millijoules for every centimeter squared. So I know how many centimeters squared we've got, 13,744. I need 40 millijoules for each one of those. That's how much UV energy I need to provide. Millijoules is 1 1,000th of a joule. So 40 millijoules per square centimeter is the same as 0 0.04 joules per square centimeter. And a joule is a watt times a second. So 0 0.04 watt seconds per centimeter squared is what I'm aiming to apply. And that is the intensity of the radiation multiplied by the time. And the time I already calculated from the hydraulics, hydraulic residence time, 0 0.4812 seconds. So that tells me that the radiation field should have an intensity of 0 0.0831 watts per square centimeter. So that's just the dose that we want to achieve on that outside area of the cylinder. And power compared to intensity takes the uh, overall area into account. So if it was 0 0.0831 watts per square centimeter, then we multiply that by the area of the reactor and it should be 1142 watts and then finally the power of the lamp since there's a 30 percent efficiency factor then that means we have to divide by 0.3 and so to provide 1142 watts of uv that means we have to put into the lamp 3808 watts of electricity so this reactor is going to be guzzling a lot of electricity, but we're also treating a lot of water, 250 liters of water every second. So uh, any questions about that? Does anybody know how much electricity costs? Any, anybody? <laughs> month, <laughs> electricity is about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is 3.8 kilowatts. So to run this reactor for an hour is costing about 50 cents, you know, 45, 50 cents. So 50 cents of electricity and you're treating 250 liters every second. So in an hour, let's see, that's uh, 3,600 seconds and uh, 0.25 cubic meters per second. So you can treat 900 cubic meters of water for about 50 cents of electricity. So I mean, that's a pretty good deal. It's a lot of water. Uh, any questions on this example? 
I plan to put together a disinfection homework assignment um, after you submit this one that's due on Monday. And just to get some additional practice with both chlorine and UV, I'll put a UV problem on that homework that's going to ask you to go through kind of uh, similar thinking as this. So uh, if you need to come back to the example, of course, it'll be in the YouTube video. So I spent three years studying the fouling of these quartz sleeves. That was my PhD dissertation, was the chemical reactions and the effects of when UV reactors have the quartz sleeves uh, with mineral accumulation. And there's a, ends up being quite a lot of different stuff that can um, put itself onto the surface of these sleeves and how the performance Obviously, if the intensity of the light is lower, then there's not going to be as much disinfection going on. So um, let's move on to talking about corrosion. And of course, corrosion is a problem with um, the durability of the distribution network. You know, if you put pipes in the ground and uh, they only last for 20 years and then you have to replace them again, then that can be really expensive. But it's more than just a, a cost issue. It's also a human health issue. Um, because corrosion, if that means that the, the pipe is getting into the water, something about the water is actually dissolving the pipe. If the pipe is made out of something dangerous, then that means people are going to be consuming that dangerous constituent, which is in the pipe. And um, unfortunately, a lot of pipes are made out of dangerous things. Plastic's not so good. You've probably heard there's an increasing amount of attention these days on microplastics in water, microplastics in food. You know, they say you shouldn't microwave food with plastic wrap over the top of it because the, uh, the plastic softening agents are thought to have carcinogenic properties. So plastic's not good. Metals can be toxic. And what do you suppose is, uh, where am I headed with this? What metal is in pipes and we're really not a fan of having into the water. Lead. Wow, that was great. Lead, exactly. It turns out copper is also not so hot, but it's way less dangerous than lead. Um, lead poisoning is an issue because there's no safe exposure to lead. It can cause neurological problems. It can cause damage to organs. Uh, it can cause acute symptoms like abdominal pain, um, reduction in... Um, blood oxygen transfer due to anemia, um, reduced IQ. When they uh, stopped using lead in gasoline, there was a marked increase in the intellectual performance of the average American child and a huge reduction in crime that a lot of people think was directly attributable to removing lead from gasoline. So lead used to come to people from a lot of different sources. There was lead in paint, lead in fuel, and unfortunately, there's still lead in a lot of pipes. Um, between 15 to 22 million people have lead in some of the pipes between the treatment plant to their house. And it may not be the entire path is lead. And in fact, that's probably nowhere that the entire pipeline between the treatment plant to the house is lead. Um, most of the time, it's just that last couple of hundred feet where maybe it's a lateral line from the road to the house or maybe inside the house. Um, but um, even if the, the lead is only in somebody's house, the municipality can't say, well, that's not our problem. Um, ironically, they're still responsible for providing lead-free water to the house, even if the pipes have lead in it. And the reason for that is that what contributes to lead getting into the water is the uh, water quality. Um, I, I guess I should say chemical characteristics because under certain pHs, lead won't dissolve and under other pHs, lead is more soluble. There's a lot of factors that affects how soluble lead is. And so if a drinking water utility is paying careful attention to, um, to hardness, alkalinity, pH, their disinfection regime, all of those things can be kept under pretty tight control, and if it is, then there's 
likely to be a pretty limited amount of lead in the water, even when someone's pipes have lead in them. Um, the uh, 1991 lead and copper rule implemented what are called action levels. And in the case of the copper concentration, that action level was set based on human impact. The, uh, so it was determined that concentrations less than 1.3 milligrams per liter are, un are unlikely to be harmful. Um, but remember, lead has no safe concentration. And so this limit of 0 0.015 milligrams per liter, it's not because that's the limit that will keep people safe. That was just kind of a limit that they thought was achievable based on available technology. And so it was more of a compromise. You know, that concentration still will cause problems for people. It's just that's the best that we can do in some circumstances with the infrastructure that's available. So it's kind of sad that that's the case, but uh, that's what it is. Um, corrosion control can be achieved by having the appropriate amount of carbonate in solution because you want to have a little bit of uh, calcium carbonate coming down and coating the walls of the pipe, but not too much because if you have too much accumulation of scale in the pipe, it reduces the uh, capacity. Um, so you can control corrosion by keeping the pH in appropriate range with uh, the addition of CO2 or adding acids, phosphate, and the addition of other things. So just in the last minute, I want to tell you about uh, fluoride is added to drinking water to try and prevent dental caries like cavities. But too much fluoride can also cause dental disease, fluoridosis. Uh, fluoridosis affects people's uh, teeth. Even higher concentrations of fluoride can cause bone deformities. And uh, some groundwater sources have too much fluoride and it ought to be removed. Uh, the government did a lot of study of the optimal dose of fluoride to prevent dental caries. And, uh, Back in the mid part of the 20th century, they come up with this empirical equation that related the uh, temperature of the outside air to the dose of fluoride that should be added because they found that obviously kids drink more when it's hot. And so the warmer the climate, generally, the more people will drink. And so the concentration of fluoride should be lower because we want to have overall a certain amount of mass of daily exposure. And so the concentration times volume would give you that mass. And so the more people drink, the less fluoride ought to be in the water. All right, 1250, we're out of time for today. Hope you have a good weekend. Remember that the assignment is due on Monday. So I will see you then.